Hi, welcome to Virtual Studio. I'm doing a short introductory uh, demonstration of some of my classes. Um, this first one is this painting right here um, with ideas for uh, very common objects and uh, painting them with interesting, exciting backgrounds. It also shows mingling how I mingle my shadow shapes and how I get in and get out without having to glaze. Welcome to Virtual Studio. Hi, going to do a few um, nice little quick study of some tomatoes. Um, the same thing could be done with all kinds of other fruits or vegetables. I've done them with olives. I've done them with cherries. Um, I'm going to experiment with a little bit of a different background. Um, this could be a wonderful little gift for a neighbor, um, a birthday present, a family member. Um, I take hundreds of photographs, and I have multiple photographs of a clump of tomatoes that I found in a grocery store with this stem attached and try not to be a slave exactly to the tomato, to the picture, I have come up with a little bit of a composition that I like. I find that the um, cast shadow from the stem is really interesting, and this is what I'm drawn to, so I'm going to start to paint it. Now, I don't mix a lot of colors. I let my colors mix on the paper. And I use 300 pound paper. I have mostly transparent watercolors. I will talk about them as I go along. Um, I work dry, my paints are all dry. And before I start any time to paint, I dampen and moisten them all. I have a pad here that's made up of paper towels folded inside a handy wipe and I use that all the time to control the amount of water that's on my brush. So the first thing I'm going to do today is I'm going to take a dry cleaning pad and I'm going to go over top of all my pencil lines and lift the excess graphite off. Now the graphite I think makes the color muddy sometimes. So this is a little step that I do and these little these dry cleaning pads that are used by architects are very handy for that. So that's kind of my first step. So I'm going to do the right hand tomato first. And as I said, I don't mix color on the paper. Oh, excuse me. I don't mix color on the palette. I mix it on the paper. I do tend to dampen the highlighted area to try to keep it light. And then the next step I do is I look at my black and white. I have my color photographs and I always, always have a black and white. So the black and white tells me how much paint to put there. That's a lighter value than in here, a little bit lighter, a little bit darker. So that's the way I work it. Now I'm going to start with New Gamboge. And I put New Gamboge or Gamboge Nova right out of the well onto the parts of the tomato that I want to glow. And the reason I do that is because the yellow, it's a very powerful pigment. And it tends, it has characteristic of pushing itself through kind of bold, it pushes itself through any other, any color, of course, except its complement, which is violet. But anyway, I'm putting the yellow where I want there to be a glow. Now, my goal is to work this all at once. In other words, I don't want to have to go in and put another glaze, a glaze of, of a, a I don't build up my darks by glazing. I build my darks up by infusing the paper with more paint. 
That is a orange, and I've put the orange around the highlight. If I lose the highlight, I'm not worried about that. I can always lift it out. Now I'm pulling the orange over top of the gamboge. I'm using Translucent Orange by Horde M. Schminke. It's a new color to me, and I really love it. So I am dropping the orange over top of the yellow. And I will work this whole tomato until it's all wet. Now I'm going to change, and I'm going to get into some reds. My go-to red for years has always been the beautiful Scarlet Lake by Hobein. It's transparent. It doesn't make mud. So I pull, I put the, the red down on the, dry on the dry paper to meet the wet. Now what I'm doing is the area that doesn't have the yellow, the gamboge underneath it, won't glow. I'm counting on that new gamboge to push its way through. So those are, these are so far, I'm building up the colors with translucent orange, gamboge, and scarlet lake. Now this is my map. I'm going to pull more Scarlet Lake up into that area, kind of carving out the shape of this. A little bit more orange right in that area. Now, while this is all still wet, I'm going to change from a round brush to a flat brush. And the reason that I'm doing that is because the round brush carries a lot of water. See the drips from the, the brush? The flat brush doesn't carry as much water. So my chance of making a blossom or creating a problem for myself are much better if I use a flat brush. Those have been all with the warm reds that I've used. Now I'm going to switch a little bit. I'm going to go to Permanent Rose, which is cooler, and I'm going to start mingling or letting that cooler red darken and cool parts of this tomato. Again, I'm looking more at this than my color photographs. So wherever I see a change in value, I'm dropping a little bit more. Right now what's on my brush is permanent rose and a little bit of quinacridon magenta. Okay? Now, you all know that 300, I work on 300-pound paper. You all know that everything dries much lighter than it looks in watercolor. So if this is going to dry lighter than I want it to, I'm going to take Artist's License and I'm going to really, really darken this. My chances of it looking better... Now I can also use the flat brush for this. If I don't like the transition from warm to from the yellow to the red, I can just very gently with the flat brush move that up. I notice I'm always touching this pad. Okay? So back to getting it dark enough. So if I think that that is going to be dry three times lighter, then let's Darken it right now. I think I need to go a little bit darker in here. What I have on my flat brush is Scarlet Lake. 
I think I got that a little bit too light. I've totally lost my highlight. Happens all the time, but I have a magic brush that I can get it back with. So I cut down the yellow, and now I want to darken the red even more. I want to make that tomato sit down. Now there's two ways I can do this. I can use brown matter, and the color that I use to, to darken all my reds, I'm still working on this with the magenta to darken that. Now as long as this is wet, it's going to flow together. So don't let it get dry on you. When it stops flowing, you know that you've got to dampen it or it has to be wetter. So the one color that I've used for years to darken my reds is mineral violet. Now mineral violet is granular, but it's one of my go-to colors. Vertiger blue, mineral violet, brown matter. So I am dropping the mineral violet into the bottom of the tomato to darken it. It is a very granular color, so don't overdo it. But I've used it for years to darken reds. Works beautifully. So my, go my map of what I'm doing is in front of me in my black and white. It's like a value sketch. It's like a value sketch. But I use it to build up the contours of the tomato. It could be a pepper, it could be a cherry, it could be an olive. But that's how I mingle my colors and get in and get out. I'm not much on glazing. I try not to have to glaze. So I've done one. I'm going to do another one. I'm going to, I'm going to do this one. So let's Instead of losing the highlight, like I did, let's see if I can hang on to this highlight. So I dampen the shape of the highlight. Now, next step, I'm going to put, with a round brush, I'm going to put new gamboge right out of the well. Notice, I haven't made any puddles. I've tested my paint. But I don't work out of puddles. I work out of the well. So into the well of Gamboge, I see the glow on this particular tomato down in this area. Now I'm putting this, the ratio of water to pigment here is like whole milk. Don't be afraid. to. You need to put this on with a lot of pigment, okay? Well, it seems that I forgot to draw, draw the, um, stem in there. Sorry about that. So again, it's the same concept. I'm dropping the gamboge, the thickness of whole milk onto the shapes of the tomato that I see as having a glow. Now I'm going to start again with the Translucent Orange by Horridum Schminke. I'm going to pull it over top of the gamboge. That's pure translucent orange by Horridum Schminke. Now with the round brush, I'm going to start with my Scarlet Lake. Scarlet Lake on dry paper. Scarlet Lake pulled up over top of Gamboge. Put 
pulling that up over top just so there's not such a, a break. Scarlet Lake, again, wherever I pull the Scarlet Lake over top of the yellow, the yellow pushes through and creates a glow. As I'm getting down into the bottom of this tomato, where I want it to sit down, I'm going to start darkening. I'm going to start with brown matter, taking some brown matter. And the brown matter is by, there are several people make brown matter. They quit, Holbein quit making it. And um, so now there is, Cheap Joe's makes a quinacridon burnt scarlet, formerly Lucky Penny. Now I'm taking the flat brush and I'm picking up some cooler reds, permanent rose and quinacridone magenta. Now I'm going to start darkening some of the reds. There's a dark patch goes across here. So anyway, there are several places that have come up with a brown and took it off the mark, took it off their list. Um, you can get quinacridone burnt scarlet by Daniel Smith, which works beautifully. You can get brown matter by Windsor Newton, which also works well. And the one that I previously mentioned, Cheap Joe, Joe Miller. Good old Joe. What a great guy he's been. So now I'm darkening. There is a shadow created at the bottom of this. So I'm going in with quinacridone magenta. Quinacridone magenta. Permanent rose. Cooled it down. And then the last color that I'm going to put in is mineral violet. So I take the mineral violet. Notice what I'm doing. I'm picking it up out, right out of the well. Tapping my, bro tapping my pad so I don't get too much water. The pad is used to control the water. It's also going to be quite granular. So I'm careful. I don't overdo the mineral violet. Always, always exaggerate. This whole this whole um, trip that we're on, this wonderful art exploration that we're on, is all about exaggeration. You have to look, yeah, you like that image, but, you know, it could be made better, so you have to look and see how you can make it better. Right now, I'm dropping a combination of mineral violet, a little bit of mineral violet, a lot of... permanent rose and, and quin magenta. So I have darkened one side of this. So that's how I get in and get out without glazing. That's part of the process. I'm going to set that aside and I will do the third tomato, but because this is a short introductory class, I would do this tomato in the back with a lot of cool reds. Very little, if any, gamboge. And keep it very cool and much darker. But I have lost my highlights. So I did lose both of them when I was painting that. And I'm going to take right now, I have a brush that I'm, actually I use this brush to finish all my paintings. I soften the edges and I clean up edges. And The key thing is that to put, 
pick out a highlight. I could have put masking there, but I hate masking. So I'm wetting the dry paper. Now, if you're in Florida like I am, and you're working on 300-pound paper that hangs on to the moisture a lot longer, you need to make sure that this is really, really dry. So I have a, what I call a scrub brush, and I'm now going, I wet the shape of the highlight. I wet the shape of the highlight, and now I've lifted it out. And there's your highlight. I see another highlight over here, right here. You wet the dry paint, and you tickle the paint, and then you blot. Okay? I've caught myself even painting with this brush. So, so that's two parts of this little lesson, but the next one is, I think, the one that everybody likes the most. I'm going to mingle, I'm going to mingle the shadows. Now, the basis of all my shadows is Vertiter Blue. Vertiter Blue by Holbein is a very transparent blue to me. It's transparent. Um, it's much more transparent than Cerulean Blue. So I'm going to mingle out of puddles. So I'm going to make some puddles. And the puddles, the consistency of the paint, ratio of water to pigment, is about oh, skim milk. Skim milk. Vertiter blue, I'm going to put... Um, some red into the, because we're, we need a shadow underneath these tomatoes that is going to be realistic. The shadow, the object is, is, the shadow is always the color of this part of the color, the surface it's lying on, and the objects it's casting the shadow. So it's going to have a red in it, and I'm going to use a little bit of permanent rose, and I have a beautiful color by Sennelier, which is called quinacridone red. I'm going to use some brown matter. I'm going to use a little bit of sap green. I'm going to use a little bit of mineral violet. So if I have those puddles out, I can then go into them and create the shadow. When I want the shadow to be darker, I will use a more intense blue, which is cobalt blue. So cobalt blue, instead of vertiter blue, to darken. Okay? So I'm going to start right up under the dark, the darkest chair, the darkest um, tomato, and I'm going to start with the color of the tomato, which is I'm going to use brown matter. So I put the brown matter on dry paper, and I put, make a shape. Now I'm cleaning my brush off, and because I want this shadow back here to be a little bit darker, the shadow is darker under the object and then lightens up as it comes out into the light. So I'm going to use the cobalt blue, and I'm going to join the cobalt blue to the brown matter. Now I'm not going to cover all the brown matter. I'm just going to let that cobalt blue do its own thing. Now, before between each color, I clean my brush and tap it on the pad. Now I'm mingling or I am dropping in, joining to the other colors a little bit of sap green. Okay? So back into the cobalt blue. Now, as it comes out into the light, I'm going to use a little bit more vertiter blue. So there's my shadow. Now, that's going to dry much lighter. I'm quite happy with that. So we're going to go across. I'm going to do the same thing. 
I'm going to use a different red. Let's try a permanent rose. Picking up permanent rose, and I'm putting the permanent rose right underneath the tomato. Then I'm going to go in and put a little bit of mineral violet in it. Because I know some of you are going to ask me, is there a formula? There is no formula. I just go for it. That's more cobalt blue. Don't cover all the beautiful, don't go in and cover up all those beautiful things that are happening on the paper. Okay? Take your time. Now I'm going to go with some more sap green. I know it's not there, but who knows? So there's my, now more, I'm going to go into the cobalt blue a little bit, darken back in there, and then as I, You can make the object sit down by darkening the shadow underneath. Now I'm going to, I'm out in the light, so I'm now going to mingle into this some verditer blue. And I really don't care whatever colors it makes. Now, let's continue this shadow. Let the green mingle down in. Change your colors every two or three strokes. I'm into permanent rose, sap green, verditer blue. Now I'm going to go into some cobalt blue. This is the shadow coming off that beautiful stem. When I bought these tomatoes, I spend a lot of time in the grocery stores. People get very upset with me because I don't move along very quickly. But I'm always looking for vegetables with character. I don't know if that makes sense to any of you. This is now verditer blue. And I want to add a little bit of mineral violet. See how I join that? Now, I look at these shadows and I say to myself, is this? Am I repeating the colors? In other words, if I've got green there and there, I need it down in here. So I do try, because one of the wonderful rules of watercolor is to repeat the colors three times. And I tr do try to do that. And I do it in my shadows as well. So I'm starting over here. This is my cobalt blue, brown matter. Don't cover up all the gorgeous colors, but let it happen on the paper. Can everybody see that? Quite beautiful, even if I do say so myself. Um, now I'm joining the sap green, as long as it's wet, it will work. I've done a lot of homework over the years that I've been painting. I've learned the colors that like each other, that mingle together. I've made mistakes just like all the rest of you. I fell in love with the color once, I won't name it, but and I started throwing it into a painting that was really kind of not half bad. And... Um, before I knew it, I had mud, and it was all because I hadn't tested the paint ahead of time. So I really have done a lot of the homework for you. And my palette colors are the colors that like each other. So that's how I mingle shadows. Let's do a little bit, while that dries, let's do a little bit on the stem. Now, I look at my black and white here, and I see, wait a minute, let's stop. There's, I need to make that tomato sit down. So, I'm going to take my flat brush, and I'm going to go right into Quinacridon Magenta, now, if I don't say a manufacturer's name, it is 
you can assume it's the paint is by Holbein. So with the flat brush, and because that was still shiny wet, I was able to go in and increase the value of that part of the shadow. So based on my stem, I'm going to do a little bit of it. Um, I'm going to start with a roly in yellow. I like a roly in yellow and I like new gamboge or gamboge nova. And that's my cool and my warm yellows. So I'm going to put the highlight on the stem. I used a roly in yellow, and that highlight then switches to the inside over here. Now I'm taking the pigment right out of the well. I'm not got a, I have no little juicy puddle. So right now, while that's still wet, where the yellow is still wet, and that's what I want. I want it to be damp because I want this to move. Now I'm going to take a little bit of sap green right out of the well, and I'm going to paint the sap green right up to the edge of the yellow. Taking it right out of the well. The reason I wanted the yellow to be wet is because I wanted this to have a soft edge. If I don't get a soft edge, if I have a problem with it, like I did not hanging on to my highlights, I will go in and soften it with a brush after it's dry. So I'm going in with sap green. And it's pretty much, um, it, it's probably more paint than water when you do this. Now because the yellow right here is not damp, I'm getting a hard edge. So I'm going to go in, take my brush, and dampen it. Help that move. You know, watercolor is all about the water. And how the water moves, how the paint moves is because of the water. And you need water for paint to move. Now I've picked up another color. I'm picking up a little bit of brown matter. I like to drop brown matter into the sap green here and there for darkness and intensity. And that can all be done while it's still damp. So if you've got railway tracks, the water, if you've got the railway tracks, the paint is going to move for you. So I've used the brown matter to increase the value of the green. I like to use a color that's in the object. So I've in made that a little bit more dramatic. I'm softening dragging a little bit of whoops dragging a little bit of water like i mentioned before if i don't get the effect i want if i lose that highlight that i love 
I will lift it out later. Okay, so I'm going to just move on to the background and the foreground. I'm going to start putting some background in now. Um, everybody hates backgrounds, including me, so I'm always looking for new ideas and for several years now, I've been doing a few different things with backgrounds. Um, here are some cherries that I've got photographs of that I'm going to do. But I've done backgrounds, dark backgrounds. I've painted, back, I've painted objects on stained glass. I've painted tomatoes on uh, wrought iron furniture. I've even painted tomatoes on comics. In fact, one of the classes that I'm going to be doing will be doing a background, an object with comics. So here's a couple of versions of tomatoes on comics that could be interesting. If you notice, it's the same tomatoes. So um, one of the background that I'm going to do today is going to be a checkerboard. Okay. Here is the finished painting right here and I'm not ever been a big fan of black but with every box of paints that I acquired I got a black and I got a white and um, never threw anything out that's hint hint don't ever throw, throw anything out because you'll be amazed utterly amazed at how eventually will, you will use the paint you never thought you would. So in my search for black, I had peachy black and I had night black and I had all, all of the blacks that you could imagine and I did a little test, took all the paints out of the boxes and tried them and didn't like very many of them. But I did find, and I for years, and there are students of mine out there that are going to laugh when I say this, but for years I hated Payne's Gray. But I found that it gives a great, great, intense, rich black. So I take about, I take a tube of Payne's Gray and I squeeze about well, I squeeze a couple of inches into a plastic container that has a lid. And I keep that just like I do white. One of the classes I'm going to be doing is how to mix your own, make your own opaque paint. But anyway, here is the black all mixed up so it will be consistent. I don't want, I'm not going to do it out of my palette because each time I go in here, I'm pulling out the exact amount of water and paint to ratio. So I will take the black and I will put it right on my dry paper and I'm going to take this background and as you can see I'm going to go over top of over top of the shadow. Now I'm not going to bore you with painting a whole background, but I do want you to see how you can make this really exciting little gifty painting for yourself or for one of your girlfriends. And trust me, it doesn't have to be tomatoes. I've done it with peppers. I've done it with cherries, so right over top of that beautiful shadow, I know it hurts, make the corners connect, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose this one, so put that all together and come up with a wonderful background. Always 
try to be exploring. You know, it's you get tired of painting the same old, same old, just like I did. And look for inspiration everywhere. I, um, I've always loved a company by the name of Mackenzie Childs. They are from upstate New York, and for a while I lived in Buffalo, New York, and they're in the Rochester area. And their whole dish line is done with black and white squares. So I don't own black and white squares, but I do look for things that I love. So I hope you enjoyed this. This is just the beginning of a set of classes that I'm going to do through Virtual Studio. Um, upcoming class that I'm going to do soon is Shadows on White. I love colorful shadows. And I'm going to be doing a class probably next week. I'll just set this aside and show it to you, okay? So we're going to do a gardenia with colorful shadows. So here's the gardenia. And again, the concept that we used for these beautiful shadow shapes being cast by the stem on the tomatoes is what we're going to do with the gardenia. It's a white object and we're going to leave the white paper and we're going to put colorful shadows in. I thank you for watching. I hope that you will join me again real soon. I'm planning on doing some really exciting things. Thank you very much.